Yes. Hello, everyone. So, um, yeah, I'm the um, lead for insights and evaluation for the um, health and wellbeing program. Um, I was asked to come and talk today um, around our, our vision and our strategy, but more specifically, um, how we responded to the pandemic in terms of self health and wellbeing, and how that's kind of changed and is informing our strategy um, as we go through um, through the phases of the pandemic and hopefully at some point um, beyond the pandemic, although we know the end is far from in sight at the moment. Um, so first of all, how do we respond? Um, in March last year, um, a team was brought together um, at PACE staff who were redeployed from uh, around health and um, care from NHS England, myself from Health Education England, um, to pull together a, a national programme that would help us support all the 1.3, 1.4 million people who work in the NHS in England through the pandemic. So a significant task. Um, we wanted to start from having a clear evidence base. An expert group was pulled together and we captured learning and evidence um, from previous major incidents from previous pandemic and used that to inform what we were going to do. The focus was on providing support. At this point, proactive and reactive support. And as I've said, with a focus on the evidence at PACE. The programme was launched on the 8th of April uh, last year. Um, this is a very busy slide, you won't be able to read all of it, but just to give you a sense of what the programme is, how it's developed over the kind of course of 2020 and where we fed in the feedback loop. So initially we had helplines, apps, um, guides, for managers, guides for individuals, um, and a series of webinars. This then developed to um, coaching and mentoring, common rooms, and then when we received feedback that staff were facing particular challenges, we've added in things like support for working parents, financial support, later on understanding a bit more about the psychological support needs for staff we added in the react mental health training that neil referred to in his presentation for example again further support for leaders and managers we've heard a lot today about the importance um, of line managers and of leadership and more recently physical health and an inclusive health and well-being program that takes account of uh, the demographic factors that we heard about earlier. We fed in feedbacks based on our People Pulse, which was a very short survey that was initiated um, in June, July last year and is giving us monthly data that gives us a sense of how NHS staff are doing and what their needs are. Um, we had um, an evaluation um, completed for us by some academic health science networks. We've had feedback from volunteers who work on the support helplines who are letting us know what staff are telling them. And then further um, phases of the People Pulse, which now takes place monthly. Um, this just gives a little sense of kind of where we're at in terms of the programme. We've now reached a point where there have been over a million contacts with health and wellbeing support, be that people accessing support and guides via the website, downloading the apps, contacting our helplines, coaching sessions, working on the um, physical health and wellbeing, and also those accessing the wellbeing webinars, um, which were designed for leaders and managers, but we know that a range of the workforce accesses those. Um, my challenge for the Health and Wellbeing Programme, which is somewhat unprecedented um, in its scale and scope, uh, was to identify how we would evaluate it, how we would understand that, that what we are doing is the right thing, how we work out what else we need to do, 
and also um, to make sure that we are supporting everyone. So this evaluation approach um, that I developed has kind of different levels to it. So at one end, the quantitative data, user engagement, essentially counting things, um, counting how many people are accessing the website, counting how many people are contacting our helplines. And we've been able to track and see how that's changed through the course of the pandemic. For example, we, we can see um, when lockdowns happen that staff are accessing more support, calling the helplines more frequently, for example which we would expect to see, but is very kind of informative in terms of those times when we think staff need more support. Um, we're collecting high level feedback, um, you know, user satisfaction surveys, and um, the demographic data um, has been a challenge because from the perspective of the evaluator, I start off, doing what is the right thing, but it is a position as the evaluator you don't want to be in, which is that I'm not going to ask for any information from anyone accessing support if it's going to put them off accessing support or place any barrier there. So we have limited demographic data, but the data that we're collecting is starting to show us um, some pictures around who is more likely to access support where we've triangulated it. Um, so women are more likely to access support, nurses are more likely to access support. These are the kinds of things we're starting to learn. And from the perspective of the evaluation, what's really important is not only to look at this at a meta level, not just to count the million contacts and the proportion of women who are contacting the service, but actually to understand individuals experiences of their own health and well-being and of their accessing health and well-being support as we've heard everyone has a different personal history different personal circumstances and how people access support how people respond to health and well-being support is going to be different for everyone so that experience um, which i've formulated into an illuminative evaluation approach is equally as important for us as, as counting the numbers. We have some high level um, findings from the programme to date. We know that it's been accessed a significant number of times. And for those people accessing support and choosing to give us feedback, that's been highly, highly positive. We're starting to understand the ways in which we are supporting people through this programme around self-help, around providing opportunities for resilience and reflection, supporting leaders and managers and helping staff to support their colleagues. We're also understanding around how we have needed to um, adapt continually the health and wellbeing support offer. We've stood some things down, which is not always an easy decision to do, but where um, we don't think it's the right thing um, or it's not being accessed in the way that we would hoped, we have had to take the decision to, to stand some things down. But what that's meant is that that has allowed us to develop and incorporate new offers as we learn about staff need. So, in terms of a sort of process evaluation, we've learned a lot about how we responded, how we've adapted and evolved the offer um, through the last 16 months. We do have some emerging findings that we are having a positive impact for individuals, for colleagues. We have a lot of people giving us feedback um, that they are supporting their colleagues or they have supported their been supported by their colleagues and also for teams. Um, however, we, we aren't going to be complacent. We also know that we're not reaching everyone. We're not supporting everyone and there is more to do. We are understanding a lot more about what the barriers are for people accessing support. Um, none of these will be a surprise to any of them, and many of them relate to 
the culture and leadership of organisations and managers as much as to anything else. So time, um, a lack of awareness, we have yet more and more to do around communication and awareness the raising of our support, a lack of trust. We've discovered that if somebody doesn't have a trusting relationship with their line manager, they are less likely to access the national support offer, even though that is several steps removed. They don't feel confident that somehow their line manager won't find out and it won't be detrimental to them. Feelings of tiredness and overwhelm. I'm too overwhelmed to even think about accessing support. Um, issues around not wanting to admit um, that they need help. We often hear this from clinicians. I am a caregiver. I help people. I don't need help myself or I don't want to admit that I need help. Um, feedback that we've taken around the offer being overwhelming. Perhaps there's too much, particularly when you add in local offers from organisations as well as the national offer, it's a bit confusing. How can we simplify it? More positively, staff have fed back to us that they don't feel they need to access health and wellbeing support um, or they have other sources of support which is helping them. Um, so that's the national offer as it was developed in response to the pandemic specifically. We are now developing our longer term strategy for the programme, trying to move beyond being reactive and more preventative and that focus on culture and that long term change. And in terms of culture and that long term change from the NHS England perspective, we also have a way to go, but moving beyond targets and metrics, particularly things around sickness absence and things that might be seen as a performance management and moving much more into a supportive culture change approach. Um, again, this is a very busy slide, but just summarises um, the approach that we've got and where different parts of the programme feed in. Prevention. Um, supporting line managers, supporting that culture and leadership, as we discussed, local and system level occupational health and well-being. We're supporting enhanced health and well-being programmes within integrated care systems, which cover the range of um, things that you see there. And for those that need it, more intensive and more specialist support. In, we now have set up a program of 40 system-wide mental health and well-being hubs which provide proactive outreach, rapid clinical assessment and coordinated care and onward referral. This is supported by a program of professional nurse advocacy training, particularly for those who are in those frontline situations such as within critical care, again, to allow those opportunities for reflection and supporting colleagues, um, as Neil referred to within his uh, presentation. In terms of the evolution of the programme and of our strategy, we have three areas of key focus at the moment. The first is around wellbeing guardians, which is for NHS trusts, a board level posi position within the organisation. Originally a recommendation from the Sir Keith Pearson review into learner and workforce wellbeing and boards and we're working with their health and safety executive to develop a much more sophisticated dashboard to consider health and well-being than may have been available previously which would have focused on one question in an annual staff survey and staff sickness rates for example. Again the real importance of good leadership in health and well-being as we've learned 
many of the health and well-being issues that our workforce, our people have experienced through the pandemic were not just caused by the pandemic itself as a primary stressor, but actually the organisational leadership management response as a secondary stressor and the impact that's had. Following on from that, we are also doing more following from the REACT training to support line managers and teams. Again and again today, we've heard about the importance of your supervisor, your line manager being supportive. And we're making sure that line managers and supervisors are well equipped to have those informed conversations with their, with their teams. And we're also, as I mentioned, working on continuing to deploy evidence-based interventions through the mental health hubs and through um, the Enhanced Health and Wellbeing Programme. And we will have a focus also on occupational health becoming an integral part of health and wellbeing and moving from something that's very reactive, that people are only in contact with occupational health when they are already unwell, to being integral to the preventative approach. And that is what is sitting at the heart of our longer term strategy and through what we hope will soon be the recovery process from the pandemic. Um, and finally, um, from a evaluation and particularly from my perspective insights, we're still learning. We're continuing to learn. The research is still being undertaken, our own experts are still learning things, so we continue to work with our expert groups, we're continuing to partner with academics who are doing research on health and well-being, we're commissioning literature reviews and deep dives into particular areas, burnout is one that we're currently focusing on, we continue to capture and reflect on the findings from the evaluation programme and from individuals who are accessing support, those individual experience, individual voices, we continue to capture and reflect on that. Um, we conduct stock takes with our NHS trusts to understand what they are doing and how it feels to them, what do they think is going well, where do they need support, and the People Pulse, which was started off as a regular check-in for our workforce through the pandemic, is now being formalised into a monthly People Pulse to be supplemented by a quarterly staff survey, which will give us, I hope, um, a lot more of a regular sense of how our workforce are feeling, how we can continue to support them than the current annual staff survey. So that's it um, in a nutshell. Um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of data that, that backs up what we're doing. Um, and we are continuing to learn and always responding to, to feedback and capturing that learning. Thank you.